Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 442, The Supremes Edition. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm Alan Haley, and today is September 28, 2018. Hey, unless you're in a cave or don't have electricity or don't have access to a television or the internet uh, basically if you're a monk in the middle of Afghanistan you have no idea what's been going on in America the last two weeks we have had a nomination to the Supreme Court um, and not as it was designed it has become a political mess uh, that it's unbelievable to watch and so I thought I'd get my favorite Supreme Court uh, uh, expert on and talk a little bit about this. Um, first, Alan, you have uh, brought a case before the Supreme Court. Yes, I have. Okay. So you're perfectly, um, <laughs> it's perfectly reasonable to get you on here to talk a little bit about that. I'm going to adjust your sound here while we're going live. And you understand the three branches of government. I do. Good. You understand checks and balances. Yes, I do. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so let's talk about um, a little bit of the history of the Supreme Court, a little bit about how today, uh, at least in the last 12 years, it's acted kind of as the fairy godmother to America. Uh, if you can't get it done judicially, if you can't get it done or, sorry, legislatively or through the, uh, the proper channels, you go to the Supremes and they're very likely to help you. And well, it's a, yeah, it's a unique institution, as you say, one of the three branches of government. First of all, it, as um, Thomas Jefferson once pointed out, it has no troops to enforce its decision. It's true. It has, has no way of enforcing its decision. Uh, and it, uh, it enti entirely depends upon its moral authority. And its moral authority depends in turn on how visible it makes its reasoning and logics when it states its opinions so that it can be seen to be deciding things objectively according to the rule of law. If it doesn't have that, it has nothing. You would and agree, that's what would, well, let me interrupt real quick, would you agree with me five, four decisions hurt that? Absolutely, okay. because when you have splits of five to four, it means that they don't agree on what the applicable law is and how to, um, turn this particular case and apply the law to its facts. So, <clears throat> and that, what that does is it makes the result appear less objective, less according to the rule of law, and more uh, ad hoc and made up for the, for the moment, made up for the facts, sort of, uh, as you say, fairy godmother, can we step in here and help, help some out, some d deserving faction of victims? Uh, that are appealing to our sympathies, sympathies right now, even though the Constitution says nothing about uh, marriage, for example. Uh, yeah. We're going to step in and make sure that these people who want same-sex marriage can receive what they want. My observation, <laughs> and I've only been on this earth for, uh, for 53 short years, is the pendulum. Uh, the presidency, the executive office, goes from liberal to conservative to liberal to conservative. The legislative branch goes from li uh, liberal to conservative and back and forth. And same with the Supreme Court, the judicial branches. But it take, it's a, a slower process. It's yes, almost, it a, it's a generation to go from one side of the pendulum to the other, where you can see in four to eight years, the, pres the executive goes and even faster sometimes for the uh, legislative. Well, that's because of the legislative turnover rates for Congress, two years to six years in the Senate, four years for the president, but lifetime for the Supreme Court appointees. And so naturally, yeah, they're going to be a slower moving body of it as it is, which in, in of itself says that it really shouldn't matter because uh, you shouldn't be varying your politics. Once you get to the court and put on the black robe, you're really supposed to leave politics behind. And you're supposed to apply the law and be impartial. That's what we call having a judicial temperament, mm -hmm. which is one of the most important criterion. There are lots of people who aren't suited to be judges because they simply can't assume that calm neutrality and put bias aside that uh, is required of every single impartial judge. That's what we expect. We expect nothing less of our judges. And that's why it disappoints so much when you get a partisan judge 
who is like the one in Hawaii, for example, who just decided nationwide he's going to join all of Trump's uh, immigration policies. That's a partisan judge who's simply going out of the way to try to use his power. And it, it totally undercuts the image of the courts. It totally undercuts the ability of the judiciary to function because he's got nothing to back himself up. No moral reasons being on his side, no law on his side. He's just exercising raw power until he gets reversed. And so, yeah, anyway, so that's what happens when the court uh, veers away from objective law and reason into partisan things that have no basis in the Constitution or in their mandate that they're supposed to carry out, then they're, they're sailing on un, you know, uncharted waters and it undercuts where they've been and it makes people worry about where they're going. And that should not happen in the case of the Supreme Court. Well, let's talk a, a little bit about where they've been. If memory serves, um, the Supreme Court would only take, the, the Chief Justice would only take cases where he knew that a vast majority of the court would decide the opinion. It wouldn't be a five to four, it, you know, an eight to two, he would be happy right. with. And um, that's changed. Yeah, it has. And there's, of course, there's always been dissents and there've been some pretty famous ones, like such as in the Dred Scott decision. Mm -hmm. But um, in by and large, ever since the days of Justice Marshall, the person who was the chief justice of the court recognized the the integrity of the institution depended upon its uh, being seen as independent and not tied into any of the other branches. And so it has to be careful in the cases that it takes, that it's asked to decide. It has a doctrine of what's called non-justiciability, which means in certain cases that come up to it, the court says, no, we just are not going to decide that. It's too political. It has to do frequently with uh, political issues like uh, gerrymandering electioneering, whether a person is qualified to uh, sit in the Senate, um, whether the, for example, the most recent example, uh, in this case, one of the senators, I understand, filed a lawsuit in federal court uh, asking for an injunction against the vote on Kavanaugh because he hadn't gotten enough information, the Senate hadn't gotten enough information about the candidate yet. And so he can't exercise his constitutional right, he says, of advice and consent, because he hasn't been given the information. So he wants the court to step in and block the um, the vote. And that's quintessentially the kind of non-justiciable issue that courts stay away from. For they're, very no, good well, they're, they're supposed to. Yeah, okay. for very good reason they're yeah. supposed to. And because it, it, they can't win, no matter which way they decide in those issues, those kinds of cases, they're going to disappoint a huge block of people, and they're going to cut, undermine their own authority. So the, I can't stress enough how much the ability of the Supreme Court to continue to do its job depends on its ability to stay above the the ebb and flow of politics. And here's the problem that I see. The Supreme, all this has come to such political tension because the Supreme Court is so broken. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's making decisions beyond um, uh, judicial. It's doing legislation from from the bench. Is the court right. always here? And they've been doing that now for well over twenty years. Oh yeah. Well, the sign of that is these opinions that are so notorious that everybody wants to know, where did this come from? Griswold v. Connecticut, perhaps, starting the early one, finding a right of uh, privacy of some kind, not mentioned in the Constitution, a sort of a penumbra, of, out of a penumbra of rights uh, granted by the uh, Bill of Rights, we find all of a sudden there's this right of privacy. And look what's happened to that. Griswold v. Connecticut was in the 1960s, I think. Mm -hmm. We're now 50 years later, and we've got a right of privacy expounded into the right to marry whoever you want, regardless of what state law says, um, and about what marriage is, that means they have to change the definition of marriage in order to uh, bound, to bend under to this right to marry. We had to change 2,000 year old definition of marriage. So th that kind of decision making, when you have a, an opinion like in Obergefell, the case of the same sex marriage, it wasn't even a legal opinion. There was no precedent it could cite. It gave no legal reasoning. It was all uh, feel-good, emotional, leftist-type reasoning, and it was written by Anthony Kennedy, um, but it joined, of course, in by yes. four other <laughs> liberals. <laughs> <laughs> it's not just Kennedy. <laughs> yeah. 
So, I mean, but those those kinds of decisions, Roe v. Wade, classic one, mm -hmm. again, one made up out of whole cloth by Justice Blackman after he spent a whole uh, four or five months in the library at the medical school in um, Minneapolis. And uh, he came up with this trimester rule, made it up out of whole cloth, and it just all of a sudden became constitutional law. But there's nothing backing it up. There's nothing saying that this is the way you uh, decide a legal case that's before the Supreme Court. So this is the danger of these people that want to be uh, activists and read things into the Constitution that aren't there because then they have to invent things to support them which are not really law. And that becomes then a difficult precedent to follow because other judges trained in the law look at that, read the opinion and say, well, wait a minute, where's the holding? Where's the rationale for the holding? I can't find this anything in any previous precedent. How can it be good law? And that's the whole thing. So and then, of course, you have the litmus test. Yeah, well, uh, but you do, but I've seen time after time, even if there's no foundation to a law, a judge will still follow precedent. Yes, that's called stare decisis, standing by that which has been decided in the past. Mm -hmm. Because you want continuity in the law, you want to know businessmen and people of commerce and affairs need to know for their arrangements, is the law going to be the same in six months and a year from now as it is today? If it changes, I'll let our legislature change it, because we can deal with lobbying the legislature to, on such changes. We can control but we can't control what a court's going to decide. And so if a court won't stand by the existing decisions it's always made, it's very hard to predict then uh, what a court will do in a future case. And so that's why you, you have tremendous force of what's called the stare decisis or stand by what you've decided in the past. But that does not apply to every case, obviously. It didn't apply to Dred Scott after um, Plessy v. Ferguson came down in 1896. So uh, that it lasted that long. Dred Scott lasted 50 years or so. But it was a, um, a very bad decision, and it took a long while to get rid of. And that's what happens with these bad decisions. They stick around for quite a while. So we have just witnessed Clarence Thomas 2.0. <laughs> uh, Brett Kavanaugh was uh, a nominee. He's uh, uh, today been pushed on to the Senate. He is through the <coughs> Judicial Committee. Um, I don't want to fool anybody here. It's not just the history of the Supreme Court. It's not just original stuff. It's not just uh, the interpretation of that. It's about Roe. Yes, it is. Th this is all about Roe. And it shows you just how important it is to the Democratic Party, the Liberal Party, even the Libertarian Party, how important the Roe decision is. Yeah, they want to hang on to it by any means, follow or fair, because they, they got it. They know they got it. They weren't entitled to it. Mm -mm. As I said, Blackman made it up out of whole cloth. But once they got it, it meant a nationwide rule enacted by five people in black robes. And it took effect immediately without having to fool with state legislatures across the country, and one by one getting each of them to pass a similar bill. So once they got that, now they're hanging on to it for dear life. And the question is, first of all, are they going to be able to hang on to it? And second, should they? be able to and hang on to it because just because it's stare decisis as I say does it mean that we really have to stand by it and I'm not saying that it should be overthrown tomorrow but what should happen is the judges who approach it if they're faced with that same kind of issue again like a law comes up and it makes it more difficult to get an abortion than, than in the past maybe puts another requirement or something on it uh, certainly, maybe it makes abortion clinics like Gosnell's clinic uh, very difficult to establish and license. So maybe a law comes up like that and people say, oh, it has to be struck down, Roe v. Wade, Roe v. Wade. Well, the judges then have a duty to look at the facts of that case, look at Roe v. Wade, what it was really stood for and how it was decided, and decide if Roe v. Wade should still uh, be applicable to situations like this. And, you know, I think the day that if, if the day comes when Roe v. Wade is overruled, there will be, of course, a tremendous backlash from all the people that were so invested in it. But at the same time, the long term effect, I think, will be good on the court because it will no longer be capable of being drawn into those fights where it really has no role to play uh, and has no uh, no business anyway being there under the role assigned to it by the Constitution. Well, I, a Supreme Court can mix itself into whatever it wants. It's because there's no one holding it back. 
if five justices want to decide something, they can decide it. And there's hardly, the only way you can do that is to get another court later on to uh, overrule it. So that's our problem here. You, you have no constraints on what a Supreme Court, unfettered Supreme Court could decide other than their own sense of their own moral authority. And that's what's breaking down as we attack the membership on the court and want to say, well, we, we got a conservative in the last one, it's our turn now to put a liberal on. No, that's not the way you should be playing the Supreme Court. It shouldn't be who's conservative, who's liberal. It should be who's going to follow the law, who's going to apply the law, and based on the, their opinions that they've decided in the past on lower courts, you can see how they approach the law, how they decide these questions. And if it comes out against you where you would rather have it, but it's properly reasoned, it's based on precedent, and it's in fitting with the scope of the court's power, then you really have no ground to object to it. It, it is interesting. We have a person like Ginsburg who would rewrite the Constitution. She finds many right. faults with our Constitution. She's complained right. about it uh, her entire career. She once had some great liberal professors in the past. Um, right. And then you have the people, the constitutionalists, who want to protect every word, jot and tittle, uh, mm -hmm. in, in, until the end of time. Yeah. Uh, and, and that leads to uh, the, a lot of these divided issues. Talking about Ginsburg, I, I foresee the greatest voter registration um, movement in the history of mankind the day that it's announced she's been taken to the hospital for you know chest pain or something <laughs> like that. Uh, the conservatives will get everything they uh, can do to get the vote out. The uh, Democrats will do the same. And again, because the court is so broken, it'll polarize this country. I don't think the court was meant to be this polarizing. No. Yeah. No, and unfortunately, that's what happens when, um, you know, it used to be thought that, well, we'll have a good mix. We'll put some up there like this and some other like that. And, and it, they'll out of the mix will come something that's... Uh, you know, better than either one individually. Well, it didn't work that way because, as I say, it's partly the role of the Chief Justice. If he can't bring minds together on a consensus that's good for the court and good for the country, then you end up with five to four decisions. And that is, every time there's a five to four decision, that's a step backward for the court. And it should not have gotten that way. They won't touch the simplest topics with a 10-foot pole. Yeah. It, it, neutral principles you're taught about your first week of law uh, you know right. you're there and the guy says oh number one neutral principles we need to talk about property who owns it yeah. Yeah, i mean it's right there it's clear but boy right. you know church property before the uh, supreme court uh -uh. oh geez we won't oh, don't want the catholics mad at us because they're <laughs> in a bit of a squabble now don't want the episcopalians mad at us they just won't touch it, and it, it it's that's what the court was for I know, and they get they get proud and stuck in their ways. There's another doctrine I've had to deal with called the Ferris Doctrine, which is that if you're a member of the armed forces uh, and you get injured in a hospital, army hospital, malpractice. Got, in the original Ferris case, they left a towel in his stomach for 15 years. Yes, they did. And <laughs> uh, you can't sue the government for damages. Mm -hmm. um, you, and that's because you're on, in the armed forces, you're in the pay of the government, so they don't let you sue your superior, so to speak, for even if it's, even if it's an army doctor who caused the problem, or an army hospital. And they've been asked again and again to overrule it, and they refuse, and they say it's Congress's job to change the, the law. Well, Congress is driven by the insurance companies who don't want to add to their you know, responsibility for covering doctors and things like that, so they have beaten back all the attempts to amend the doctrine. So we're stuck with the Ferris Doctrine. And it's you know, the Supreme Court created it, it made the mess of it, and it's refused so far after F Ferris was a 1947 case. So we're coming up on 70 years of it, and they haven't changed it a bit. It's, uh, it's a, you know, I, I just shake my head because it's, they're abdicating their responsibility when they do things like that. And because of the pay structure, they don't get the best doctors all the time. And no. it, it's not like there's one case of a towel in a man's stomach. <clears throat> there's right. cases have people having the wrong limb amputated. I mean, if you go through some of the VA cases, um, oh, you just, uh, yeah, they, and particularly when dealing with pregnancy, there was a case I had with a, a woman, service woman who was pregnant, and they gave her an aspirin and sent her home. She had a fever of 106. And it was, it was actually eclampsia, and the baby was born dead. So 
uh, again, a pregnant woman, I tried to argue, a pregnant woman is not a soldier on active duty. You can't send her into truth. And I persuaded a lower court, but the Supreme Court reversed and said, no, Ferris Stockton. <laughs> it's sad because the child yeah. in her was not a soldier. Yeah. Now oh, we're back to yeah. roll again. I apologize, people. <laughs> Alan, I want to thank you for putting up with this uh, uh, discussion. But, you know, that's the reality. People have completely forgot their civics. They've completely forgot how to uh, change law, bring new law into this nation. It's not done through the, uh, the court system. It's done through uh, the legislative and executive processes. And, uh, and yeah, people somehow think that government isn't. They don't care which branch of government they're supposed to give them something. Nope. It's supposed to give them something that they want, they want and are entitled to. They got that little yeah. fairy godmother. Oh boy, he'll get it to us. <laughs> <sighs> Alan, thank you. I'm Kevin okay. Coulson. I'm Alan Haley. And this has been episode 442 of Anglican Unscripted. Mm -hmm.